you know, don't give up, fake it like you believe in yourself and learn in the moment. Learn in the moment. You can do that. I did it. I learned on the number two train going into Manhattan from Brooklyn. <laughs> Y'all, this is Todd Foolery, and as a preview for my upcoming retrospective for the famous Jed Jackson, I present to you an interview with the show's creator, for Caswell Hyman. Throughout the interview, we discuss how he went from acting on stage, to writing for television, to then pitching the famous Jed Jackson to Disney. Then we also talk about the ups and downs creating the series, how it nearly wasn't made, and why he left to work on another show after only a single season of working on Jet Jackson. Aside from that, we discuss the importance of representation both in front of and behind the camera, and his secret for making it in the entertainment industry. I'm really excited to share this conversation and hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Thanks for watching, everyone. Tell me a little bit about your experience. Like, I read that you started acting first and then that kind of transitioned further, but. Yeah, I really actually only recently realized that most of my, my entire life has been about telling stories. Mm. You know, whether it is acting, whether it's writing, um, whether it's directing, it's always been about telling stories. And it took me a long time, <laughs> actually, a couple months ago to realize to put that together but with theater i mean i grew up watching television and you know so many people say how television is so bad for you but for me a kid growing up in the ocean hill brownsville slum of brooklyn when i was little i mean it was my window on the rest of the world that i i could see stuff i could you know see people doing things that i you know didn't see in my world and um, I remember when I was a Cub Scout, our troop went to see a Broadway show, Pearly, with Melba Moore. And, you know, um, it was it was amazing to me. I had never seen anything like it. And I think that's where I got hit by the thunderbolt that, oh, I want to do that. You know, I want to be an actor. So that was a part of telling stories. Yeah. Um, went to school for that, studied acting, did plays. And then there was a point where I got an opportunity to write. Oh, because a lady saw me working with a group called the 52nd Street Project. And we would work with kids in Hell's Kitchen. We'd go away for a week, write a play for the kid, rehearse it, come back, perform it in New York. And she saw it and she thought I had a good ear for the way kids talk and asked me to come in for an interview. And it turned out to be for the show Ghost Rider. No way. Yeah. And I was like, no, I'm not a writer. I don't want to do this. But I had nothing else to do <laughs> at the time. So I was like, OK, I'll try it. And um, I started off as a writer's assistant for Kermit Fraser and Karen Greenberg Baker. And by season three, I was a head writer. Wow. I didn't know that I could do that. Um, but I had really good guidance <laughs> from them. One gentle, one tough. <laughs> um, but I had really good, good guidance and, and, um, the producer there, Liz Nealon was so welcoming. She just opened all the doors for the meetings and whatnot. And they all helped me learn to do, uh, what a writer does for television. And I had taken what I'd learned from breaking down scripts and, and playing characters in shows and plays and let myself translate that into making characters for a TV show. You know, I always play all the parts when I'm writing and I'll play little Bill, play whoever, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so that's the connection for me. And I've always felt kind of bad because I never went to school to be a writer. So, but, Somehow it kind of worked its way to, to, to complementing each other, which came back to the whole thing of it's all storytelling. Mm -hmm. You know, long answer to a probably short question. So. No, that's wonderful. Long answers all the way. Like that, that's, that's beautiful. Like I love that. I love the connection to acting and writing because there is so much because I've I've never been interested in acting. I've always been a writer. But like you said, I realized when I'm writing, I'm performing all these characters in my head. And sometimes and you're out loud. performing when you do your videos, aren't you? Right. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Some pointed that out and they were just like, you're a great performer. And I was like, I don't perform. And I was like, oh, I do. You do. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's, it's so interesting how that like intertwines and that weaves together, especially like the different types of arts and how they complement each other, because you would never assume acting would strengthen your writing or writing would strengthen your acting, but it really does. It really does, especially when, you know, I mean, as an actor, you have to get in, con in touch with your feelings. And I think you do the same as a writer, you know, when, you know, when Lil Bill is crying, I'm crying. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you know, you do just that's how you translate, you know, what's going on in your heart and your head into whatever keyboard you're working with. Right. Um, and that's what I, I believe makes it sound real and true, because I have to believe it mm -hmm. in order to put it down. 100 percent. Yeah. Um, I grew up watching Gullah Gullah Island and Little Bill and all of that. And it's just so like, I had no idea. Of course you realize like people work on different projects, but I was like always about Jet Jackson and like looking at your history, I was like, oh, he did Gullah Gullah Island too. Oh, he did Little Bill too. And I was like, I watch those shows too. And it's just like interesting <laughs> to see how that connects. But how did you get, um, I recently watched a history about Gullah Gullah Island and it was super interesting. And I was just curious, how did you get connected and involved with that? Um, what happened? I was working on Ghost Rider. It was my first job. And I had an assistant by the second year or third year. And she left and went to work at Nickelodeon. And then one day she called and, and said, hey, they're looking for a writer for a show over here. Send your info in. And I did. And then I got a meeting with Maria Perez. Brown now, me and Maria Perez Brown. Yeah. And as I, it was, you know, I was Ghostwriter was ending and they were like, come do this show. So it was just like a segue right into another wow. show. And I didn't even think anything was going to come of it because she told me, can I throw your name out? I was like, yeah, yeah, what do you mean? And said some stuff. And so suddenly I was writing as a job, I mean, as a career, because I, you know, I did ghostwriter, but I thought this is going to be a one off and I'm going to do a play <laughs> and get out of here. But suddenly I was like sucked into this, this writing thing. And I loved being with Maria and um, her, her partner, Kathy Minton. It was so that was so fun. We used to bust our butts, though. We would do two shows every week. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, we would spend from Monday through Wednesday morning filming one episode. Wednesday afternoon, we would start the next episode that we would shoot until Friday. And we had little kids, you know, the, the kids. And they were just so great um, because they worked. And, but you only have a certain amount of time you can work with kids. Right. Um, but it was just like... Uh, kind of like a factory but it was so fun at the same time although i'm not remembering all the stress and the anger and the heartache but, of course um, yeah. <laughs> you know that that's the go um, um but it was just like um you know doing a play every week and ron and natalie were wonderful and the kids oh my god it was so wonderful and was working that in a the studio camera show oh that's so it was it was yes. camera. okay it was a uh, a Three or four cameras. Yeah. Okay. Four, four cameras, I think. And um, we were shooting in uh, Nickelodeon Studios in Orlando, um, and which was great because it was, you know, connected to the amusement park, and we could walk through the back gate and go in and ride and stuff, and then go back and do whatever <laughs> we had to do. Uh, and I mean, I used to just, you know, I was like a kid in a candy store, man leaving work at you know one in the morning walking by the sound stages feeling like this is a dream so you know i mean i luckily i was lucky enough to do stuff for good pay that i would have done for free that's a real i've never heard anyone it put it that now, way but I yeah. huh? <laughs> i've never heard anyone put it that way that's that's beautiful <laughs> i loved it i loved it um and just you know boom fell into it and I, have, I was lucky enough to work with such good, kind people. We became friends. Maria and I worked together time and time again. Liz Nealon, who I met on Ghost Rider, we worked together time and time again. My people, you know? Yeah. If, if you're, you're lucky enough to, to meet people that you can both share, um, a working relationship, friendship, respect, 
that's just the greatest thing, you know, of all. Yeah. People who will say your name in a room full of opportunities, right? <laughs> yeah. And people that got your back and, right. and you have their back and, and you, you know, always looking out for the best for each other for, in, you know, whatever you're doing. That's really important, I think. Yeah. And just uh, just funny you mentioned Orlando. I grew up in Orlando. So like I grew up going to the parks and seeing the Nickelodeon studio. And like, I, I swear to this day, now thinking back on it, that is where like my passion sparked. Where I was like, I'm working for television one day. And I know it. <laughs> and it's because I had I grew up with that studio in my backyard. And my dad- Did you uh, go on the tour? I, th- I want to say I did. It was so long ago. But I remember seeing studios and I remember seeing that stuff at a very young age and just being so fascinated and just so taken by that and just like so such an awe where it's like that this is where I'm supposed to be like at like a young age and already knowing that for sure. Yeah, that's great, man. And my dad also worked at Disney. Um, He was he did a lot of repair and like electrician stuff. My dad was a he was a jack of all trades. I get a lot of my creative like passion from him. Um, mm-hmm. but he was always at Disney. And so like, I was always on going to work with him and just like seeing the stuff he was doing and just being involved with that. But my heart was at Nickelodeon. <laughs> I was like, that much for sure. No shade on Disney, but my heart was at Nickelodeon in the nineties for sure. They're very different places. Exactly. Very yeah. different to work for too. Mm. <laughs> I can only imagine it. Yeah. Oh but speaking God. of which, how did, um, so going from a, a uh, head writer and working on these different shows. How did you get to the point where you just found the courage or you found the motivation to pitch your own show? Like with the famous Jed Jackson, like how did you, how did, was the process coming up to that? I, um, my mother had moved to North Carolina where I live now. And I went to visit her. This is while I was working on Ghost Rider. And I went to visit her, and I remember I, I got to the airport. I think I got off at Raleigh, and I rented a car, and I drove down to Willard, this little town where she was living. And I was driving in this car, and as I passed by porches, people would wave. People I didn't know. <laughs> and I'm just like way back, you know, and I'm from Brooklyn, so nobody talked to anybody else. And they were waving and all friendly and everything, and I thought, how cool was that? And I just thought, started thinking about Sheldon, the guy who was the, the lead guy, the black guy in, in Ghost Rider. And I was like, wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't it be interesting if he moved to a small town like this, being a TV star? That was the whole impetus for Jet. Wow. <laughs> a, 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 a TV star who moves back to a small southern town and lives their life there. And... I pitched it out to Liz Nealon, who was an executive on Ghost Rider. And as Ghost Rider came to an end, she was having meetings all around Hollywood. And she t- called me one day. <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyway, I was working for a friend of mine on this show, 101 Dalmatians animation yes, show. Yeah, watch and that I too. I hated it. I hated <laughs> it so much. I just wound up doing one script. And I bought a house in Hollywood and I quit that job. And I was like, damn, I quit the job. I just bought a house in the hills, in the Hollywood hills. And Liz called me and she's like, I just had a meeting over at Disney. And I pitched out your idea about the kid who moved back down south. And they want to talk to you about it. And I'm like, huh? (laughs) We had a pitch meeting. And from there, it was a torturous year (laughs) of development a horrible horrible torturous year of development that finally led to to the famous jet jackson wow it was so awful oh god (laughs) there was a guy i i I won't tell you his name because he might watch something but his initials are lg and he was a brother but he was on the Disney side in development, and I just used to feel tortured by him, haunted by him. And I used to have nightmares that he was hiding under my bed. You know, <laughs> really, I had serious anxiety. This guy who I, 
I, you know, he would be my friend and everything and be, you know, yeah, you do this, do this. And then we get into a conference room with all these white executives and he would like turn on me like a snake. Well, why do you want to say that? Why do you want to do this? And I was always just like all balance with this person that was Goodness. always about him looking really good in front of the peoples. And uh, <laughs> it was torture, you know, um, it was working at Disney. <laughs> wow. Well, the product came out good. So I'm, <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy the product came out the way that it did. For sure. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Yeah, but it's not a place, you know, you have certain places where you go, oh, that was wonderful. I don't have that kind of uh, memories of that process. No. Yeah. No. Uh -uh. Well, that kind of ties into what I was going to ask next was like the 90s was I, I feel like for I, I would say this probably because I grew up in the 90s, but the 90s, I feel like was a powerful decade for kids television for black representation, because it was a lot of very much the first time I started seeing a lot of characters for television geared towards my age with characters like main characters that looked like me. So I guess you kind of mentioned it, but like, did you feel any pressure when it came to making sure like it was culturally appropriate or it represented black culture in a way? Yeah. Um, Jet was the first scripted show that they did at Disney Channel and the first, I mean, well, the first with a black lead. So oh, I did feel a pressure of representing what I thought was true. Mm -hmm. And um, there were times when I had to choose my battles. You know, like there was one time where uh, Miss Coretta, the grandmother who, um, there was a line where she said, I just got my hair did, which is the way I always heard it in my life. You get your hair did. Yeah. <laughs> and they would, they came back, they kept coming back with me at that line. No, no, it's not grammatical. She can't say that. But that's how she would say it. But that was a battle hmm. that I had to finally go, okay, fine. You know, and let that one go. I think I just um, watched that episode now that you say that. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I remember it because I remember she says because it felt odd to me because like you said, her character would have said it. I just got my I just got my hair did, but she didn't. Mm -hmm. And it, I remember it was it was very minute. It was very like just something in my head. I was like, oh, that was that was a little different. But that's so interesting. I legit just watched that episode. Wow. It's so funny <laughs> that you said it because it was one of the ones that sticks in my mind. But then there's the time where Melanie, who played Jet's mom, mm -hmm. I know that the, the auditions came down to two people. There was Melanie and there was another young woman who wasn't as warm as Melanie, wasn't as funny as Melanie, wasn't as touching as Melanie, but she was very light skinned and she had like weaves all down her hair. Yeah. And Melanie is brown skin and had dreads. Yes. But Melanie <laughs> was the better actor, the better fit to me. And to Disney, they wanted the other woman. And it came down to us going back and forth, kind of arguing about it. My partner says, Kaz, is this a battle you want to fight? And I was like, yeah. And especially when they came back to me with their reasoning and said that, the light-skinned woman with the weave looked like a, a, a movie star. Melanie didn't. You now, Jet's mother was a star. Okay. And my thing was, well, the only reason you're saying she doesn't look like a star is because you always cast this one that has European features and European hair. And maybe it's time for us to cast the best actor. Mm -hmm. And that was a fight that I won and I felt really good about because um, representation matters. And not that the other woman was not good. She was good, but she wasn't as good. Yeah. She didn't have the, the attributes that I was looking for, that warmth, that sense of humor that Melanie had. So, yeah, you know, sometimes you have to go, all right, 
I'll give in. But then there are times where you just have to fight back and, and, and hopefully teach them that just because it's the way it looks from their eyes doesn't mean that it's right. Yeah. You know? It's so fascinating you say that because I, um, cause I'm rewatching the show currently and I wanted to get a bunch in before I had a chance to talk to you. Um, but that's when I do my retrospectives. I actually watch the entire series over again. And wow. the episode where she came back to visit, she said, I, I'm paraphrasing, but she said Hollywood hair and then North Carolina hair and took off her wig and had the dreads. And I <laughs> literally clapped in my living room. Like, <laughs> yes, yes. And it was just like, I made it like it may not I may have not put that together as a kid, but my mom wore wigs growing up. And to me, that was normal. Mine too. That was normal. Mm -hmm. And so seeing that now and I remember I, I must have it must have been OK for me as a kid and it must have felt good. But I remember seeing it just like just re just Saturday and I was just bundled with joy just seeing that because it was so authentic and so real. Yes. <laughs> and so like hearing you fight for that like that is beautiful to me like that is amazing that you had to put that much effort into it because it did it made a difference it truly makes a difference and she was wonderful mm -hmm. yeah she was just wonderful and i i love her and i still catch her on stuff today you know she's still working yeah you know so <laughs> hey you know yeah yeah when you think about Jed, it makes me think about Lee, and he's gone. Yeah. yeah. Um, he was so great, man. He was a great, great person. Mm -hmm. And we had been looking for Jed. It was so scary because at one point they were like, if we can't cast this kid, we're not going to pick up the pilot. And wow. so um, we had seen almost every freaking kid in Hollywood. And one night I was at home and there was a Robitussin commercial that came on. The kid's like, my mom, such and such and such. And it was Lee. And I was like, oh, my God, that's Jet. <laughs> and I called the casting lady the next day and I was like, there's a kid on a Robitussin commercial that's perfect. And she's like, I just put him on film yesterday. And I was like, oh my God, that's him. And you know, Disney agreed. <laughs> we brought him out to Hollywood for, for a screen test because he was living in the South. And um, boom, he got the role. He was so perfect and so good uh -oh. and such a good person. And I just, you know, when he um, took his life, which I think had a lot to do with the kind of medication he was on for anxiety, depression, stuff like that. Yeah. You know, those commercials where they say this can make suicidal thoughts. They're not kidding. Yeah. You know, um, but um, it's just heartbreaking that he's gone anyway. Yeah. I He was one of the actors I followed like his entire career. Like I'd watch different shows he was in and mm -hmm. he actually 100% he was seeing that tragedy happen opened up my eyes because I struggle with anxiety and depression and suicidal thoughts. And so seeing that truly opened up my eyes, especially as a black man and seeing that and seeing that vulnerability and seeing how it affected him. I, I always look back at that and realize that was a point where in my mind, it was just like, this is a real thing. Like this can happen. This is, it is okay that you have to seek help for this. And yes. it was, it was, a, it breaks my heart because like, like you said, and I was watching the show, like he was magnificent. He was so authentic and real and just such a great actor and just watching the interview, such an awesome, great person. And it's just so hard to realize that that happened. It is, you know, it's, it's, I didn't know in the time that I spent with him that he was going through, you know, the anxiety and the issues. Um, because he was always so professional, always so prepared. But I'm happy now. I mean, I guess if there can be any happiness that comes from this, is that there's a Lee Thompson Young Foundation that encourages Black people, and especially Black men, to seek help for these issues that are real, you know, because the, the, the toxic masculinity that we are injected with as we grow up, I mean, you're not supposed to cry, you're not supposed to do this, yeah. you're not supposed to do that, is, is so, it's, it's lethal. 
-hmm. you know, and now we are learning that we can be vulnerable. We can accept that and look for help and reach out. So, you know, if anything good came from that, it, it's, you know, like it gave you a way of seeing stuff and hopefully a lot of other people, especially young men of color, because yeah. boy, are we, you know, raised to, to not show anything, to be stoic to be mm -hmm. strong, 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 mm -hmm. you know, but there's a strength in also allowing yourself to reach out yeah, and be weak. Yeah. You know, which is something I've been thinking about finding a way to write something about, but that'll come later down the line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Just like touching on that, just diving into like the, even just the relationship. Um, and they were so like, it is so, <laughs> incredible like how this show I, I don't know how well if you know how much this show resonated with me but my last name is jackson first off i was born in north carolina <laughs> um mm -hmm. my parents were separated but very cordial with each other um and then my mom moved me out to california <laughs> like and then, and then i moved back at this time my dad was living in florida at one point i moved back to live with my father in florida but he lived in a very wow. small town like and so when i saw this show it was so <laughs> mirrored my life so much and so it was just it was something that i saw and it gave me there aren't a lot of shows that portrayed divorced parents the way that you did on this show where they got yeah. along that it wasn't a big argument she was able to come to visit and it was just they had a conversation and then there was never that anticipation i haven't gotten further into the episodes but like as far as this first and half of the second season there wasn't any of jet being like oh, I really wish my parents got back together. He was okay with it. Mm -hmm. And that was just mm -hmm. how life was. And there was, there's so much power in normalizing that as well, especially in the 90s and seeing a kid and seeing that and being like, okay, my family, there's nothing wrong with my family. There's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with my parents. This is okay. Like, and there's just a, so much power in that. And I just wanted to just point that out as well because I saw that and I felt that and that did did make a positive impact on me growing up. And it's like little things like that, they made a lasting impression on the youth. And I think that's important to tell those stories as well. I'm really, um, it's really interesting you say that because I went into it doing that because my parents who were divorced mm. got along. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, and I wanted to show that, but I also wanted to idealize the dad a bit because, I mean, I, my dad and I are closer now than we have ever been in our lives. But as a young man, we were not that close. I mean, he always supported us financially, mm -hmm. but there was not a lot there emotionally or connection wise. But I always tried to make the dads on Little Bill, on Jed Jackson, Aaron Gullah Gullah Island, I always was trying to create my ideal dad, mm -hmm. the kind of dad I wish I had, who would stop and play games with us, you know, or sit down and have a real heart to heart talk with us. Yeah. Um, that's the kind of dad that I realized later on looking at is it, like, yeah, I was I was trying to create the kind of dad that I want to be the, the kind of dad I wish I had. Yeah. Um, the relationship of, of, of Wood um, Jackson and his wife kind of mirrored my parents because they they weren't fussing and fighting each other. They, you know, he could come over, get along, but Wood was more idealized. He was what, what I wanted a dad to be. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think a lot of times we do write from what we yearn in ways, from what we well, what we know and how to make it better. Especially for me when I'm writing for an audience of young people i want to be able to leave them with some kind of hope yeah. without it being all saccharine and whatnot but there's got to be some like looking at you looking at that and and thinking wow they're getting along they're fine they're normal that's a great thing to me because i i would want to to for some kid to be out there and see that you know my parents are together but that's like him he's like me We're, you know and yeah. we look like each other and stuff like right. that. So yeah. that's representation right there. <laughs> representation. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, like even just the authenticity between 
him and his dad and as him and his mom and they had their own relationships and they were always supportive they were always talking and it was just like it was it was such an interesting dynamic and i think you did it well and it's just i i just like to praise that because it's just like yeah it was done well and i these are the types of shows that i'm realizing when i'm writing these are where i got my inspiration from and these are the things that i sometimes channel in my own words and so mm -hmm. it's just it's nice going back and revisiting these and like seeing where Yep, that's definitely where I got th that value. I, this si style that I have, I picked it up here. And it's just, it's so fascinating because I'm starting to pick that up as I'm going back and revisiting a lot of these like pivotal 90s shows for me um, as I'm like progressing into my writing career. So it's very fascinating. I have to go back and watch some of that. I haven't seen those things in 20, 25, 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> me too. Man, um, long time. But I have a, I have a, I have a very curious question though. Um, well, mm -hmm. any question is curious. But in the first episode, there was one girl that was on there that was kind of like Kayla. I loved Kayla. Kayla was like when I was rewatching, I was like, Kayla's my girl. <laughs> like I love that actress. I love the character. Um, I love the will they won't they between her and Jet, and it was just done really well. But in the first episode, it was a different girl, and she never came back. <laughs> And I just, I have, that's one of the questions I just have to ask. That's about specifically about the show and just that I'm just so curious about. <laughs> we started in Hollywood. We shot it on the Universal Studios back lot. Yeah. And then once they picked up the show and everything moved to Canada. That's right. And so they didn't want to bring that girl. So they had to find somebody in Canada because, it, you know, everything comes down to money in Hollywood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to find somebody because they were bringing Jet. They were going to bring JB, but they wow. didn't want to bring um, another character, too. So we had to have a whole nother round of auditions. And then we found her and she, she was great. You know, just changed things a little bit. But it's really the same character. But it's just <laughs> right. Yeah. And it doesn't feel like it was she was replaced. It just was just like, oh, that was just another character. And she just never came back. <laughs> never came back. <laughs> Um, you leave the room and TV and you just might never come back. <laughs> that's the realest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so true. So I, these are subjects on their own and there's not I don't want you to dive too much into these, but just tell me about your, your time on Taina and Romeo. Like I honestly, I completely forgot about Romeo until like I was looking up your stuff and I was like, Wait, I, that was a show that I watched. <laughs> and I was just like, how, how did you partner with Master P? And then um, Tommy Lynch, I'm just like, I watched a lot of to uh, Thomas, Tommy Lynch's shows, like Alex Mack, Alan Strange, all of those. So I'm a huge fan of him. And so when I saw that you guys were connected, I was like, oh, wow, that's so, that's so cool. Tommy is a wild man, boy. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Man, you learn a lot when you got to work with rappers. <laughs> you know, there's the thing that you learn. You learn how to keep your knees bent. Because if you stand up straight and your knees are locked, when the ground shakes, you will topple over. So when you work with rappers, you learn to keep your knees bent at all times so that when the ground shakes, <laughs> you can do this. Right, because there was never a moment where you could just relax when you were working with this man, Master P. <laughs> Good Lord, he would come up. We were shooting in Canada, you know, and Romeo, Romeo was cool. Romeo was a kid. He was a little, you know, spoiled and stuff like that. So sometimes, like, oh, Romeo doesn't feel good right now. Okay, we'll wait, we'll wait, we'll wait. <laughs> you know, but Master P, you would need him to shoot the scenes. Yeah. He will come up, fly up to Canada, come in at 10 and say, I got to leave by 1130. <laughs> what? We're doing a TV show. I'm out of here by 1130. So then you have to, you got kids, you know, who you're supposed to be concentrating on the kids, getting them out in time. But we had to turn everything around, shoot every line he says. Yep. And let him go. And then come back and shoot the whole other pieces of the scene. <laughs> and we got it done because I I learned to have my knees bent. 
You yeah. know, one day he was coming up and we got a call that he is pissed off and he wants everything to stop. Stop shooting. Just stop everything because he's coming. And I'm like, we can't stop. We're on a schedule. They said, we have to stop. He was cussing on the phone. Blah, blah, blah. So I was like, okay, we had the whole cast, the whole crew, everybody come into this conference room. And he was pulling up. I was like, look, you guys, when he gets in the room, just everybody just stand up, start applauding and cheering and shouting. They did. He came in like, and everybody's like, <laughs> He just, it all melted away. And he's like, I'm just, you know, I just want to make sure my kids are taken care of. Ugh. Situation averted. Learning how to keep your knees bent. So, because it's all about ego with this man, right? So working on Romeo was really like, I, I did the first two seasons. I was supposed to stay for the third season, but then we were having a baby. Oh wow! And I didn't. I didn't want to be in Canada when the baby was born, so I left. I went back and directed a couple of episodes, but um, we were expecting the baby. But you know, at about eight months, the baby was still born. Oh. So that didn't happen, you know. But then, you know, a year or so later, we tried again. But um, yeah. Romeo was an interesting experience, <laughs> but I love the people there. I was working with in Canada, everybody in the crew mm -hmm. and those folks. Oh, they were just great. I just loved them. Loved them. Loved them. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> one of the things you had to do though, is like when you're up there and you're in charge, you got to make sure this is one of the things that I, I think as you go on your career and you start to move up the ladder and you become the boss, you have to insist that they bring on people of color. You have to insist that that because most people will will stick with people that they're comfortable with and people mm -hmm. that they're used to and not do the extra job of finding somebody who is completely competent because you don't want nobody incompetent, but that doesn't look like them. And that's one of the things that I'm proud to say I did on that show and other shows and brought people on who now still have careers and are doing it very well. Yeah. Um, a brother that was a, a young AD, assistant director on Jet Jackson. Now he's directed all these films up there in Canada. You know, he is the man, you know? And so I just think it's important. I mean, Cosby, I would have never got to do the head writer of Little Bill of Cosby. I mean, he's gone through a whole bunch of stuff lately, but you know, um, yeah. I didn't know that part of him, but he insisted that they have writer of color be the head writer on Little Bill. That's beautiful. They ain't know nobody but me at the time. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I had done Gullah and I had, you know, um, done um, Ghost Rider and they was like, well, who do we know? Oh, him, get him. Yeah. So, you know, I love everybody. I have worked with great people of all races and whatnot. Um, I've been so fortunate to to work with some great people. I can't really think of anyone that I would say that I hate. The guy that was under my bed in my nightmare, <laughs> I don't even hate him, you know? <laughs> so I've been really lucky. Taina, great experience, man. Great experience, great cast. Working with my pal, Maria Perez Brown again. It was her show that she created. And, you know, I came in and wrote a pilot for her. And um, it was just a joy, man. You know, there was drama. We were working with a bunch of teenagers, you know, um, but they were great, man. I, I wish I had something bad to tell you, but I don't. No, no, that's that's fine. I just I like I like hearing that. And I like seeing how everyone's kind of like kind of love what you're saying. Just like everyone's kind of connected and you work with people and you kind of grow with these people. And so. I didn't know you had worked on that show too. And I was like on the list of the next one I was going to talk about. And it was just like, oh, wow, that's so interesting that it's just like seeing that they're kind of interconnected and they're working together, and especially these shows starring people of color. And you can see that the same effort and the same like power is put behind these shows. When you talk about, when you do Taina, you got to talk to Maria, Maria Perez Brown, because she created it. And now she is the head of, Time Magazine um, 
they just started doing content for um, kids and family television. And she is heading that wow. up. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, boy. Yeah, so she's, she's doing great. And she'll be great to talk to. You'll love her. Yeah, wow. Um, but those are the important things, man, is the relationships that you have when you're working, trying to hold on to your integrity because along the way you'll find some snakes and whatnot, but mm -hmm. they don't really last. Yeah. You know, I haven't known any that have, but I guess, you know, I don't know. Maybe I haven't gone that high up the ladder to see where, where the real pythons are, but um, I've been pretty lucky, pretty cool. Yeah, your career has so been far. really great. It's been really, it's been cool, like going back and doing research for the interview and just for the show. It's just like, it's, I find it so motivational, inspirational seeing your career. And it's just so fascinating because like, Similar to what you said, you never know when these things are going to come up. And it's just almost like things kind of align for you as, as you're out there. You're doing your thing. You're doing you, you, <laughs> like the way that you can. And you're telling your stories the way that you can. And I, it's beautiful seeing that and seeing how your career went from that to acting, to writing, to books, to television, to acting again. The back to <laughs> acting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, that's the, that's the great thing about this point. <laughs> Is that I've got to, you know, go back and play in in with my first love, theater, you know, and stuff like that, and even doing a little bit of film and TV here and there, you know, yeah. on camera. Um, it's just been fun. Yeah, fun. Um, well, looking back at um, Jed Jackson, were you satisfied with the show's run, like with the what you did with the show, what you the product you were able to actually get out? <sighs> As you watch Jet Jackson, you will see that there's a big difference between season one and season five. Mm -hmm. They I'm got more that already. into, yeah, and I, I think it's good. Um, but I, after season one, coming back, I, I chose not to come back because they were, well, they fired Liz Nealon, who was my partner on the show she's the one that bought the show to disney you know was the ep with the experience and they let her go and then when it came time to negotiate contracts um i was not happy because they had fired just fired her for no reason you know and we had bought we busted our asses to bring a show in on budget we didn't go over budget not a penny and coming back the second season they're gonna cut the budget why would you cut the budget when we've already, you know, we've we put everything into it, but they were going to cut it. And then they weren't. It's like, you're going to have to move to Canada and we're not going to pay for a car. We're not going to pay for this. We're not going to do that. And at the same time, I was being courted by Nickelodeon and the Cosby thing for Little Bill. And they were offering me the world. I didn't have to move to New York. They said, we'll bring you to New York uh, for a week every month. We'll put you up in an apartment and then you can spend the rest of your time in LA and blah, 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 blah. blah. And I was like, why am I going here when I could go there where they were treating me like I felt like I should deserve to be treated? And so I dropped back to consulting on Jet Jackson and um, Sean became the EP, Sean, who we hired to direct the pilot. But Sean was, you know, looking back, everybody behind the camera became white. Mm. And they had a different thing that they were going for. Mm. There was some stuff that they were putting in that I was like, I would have never done. They brought in the blonde chick, I would have never done. <laughs> okay? I have thoughts, <laughs> but I could say. And from what I heard, her and Sean were intimate. So, you know, they did those things. But on the whole, you know, I, I, I can't say, you know, no, they suck, they suck, they screwed it up. No, they did things that were right for the show, right for what they wanted, adding more, you know, Silverstone action pieces and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, I still created that show and it still said created by Kaz Lahaim and everything. 
Ha, That's right. Wouldn't have been there <laughs> if it wasn't. So I'm I'm cool with it. You know, I made my ducats. I had to, they had to pay me, mm-hmm. and uh, I was very happy with that. Um, I missed my friends there. You know, my kids, and I stayed in touch with them, and we saw yeah. each other from time to time in LA, especially Lee and um, you know Wood and everything. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you know. That's, great. That's how it goes. But I don't think they could do that nowadays. I don't think they could take a black um, exec creator off a show without getting killed in the media. Yeah. That wouldn't have been able to happen now. You know, actually, there is a show that I'm considering doing. My lawyer's negotiating it right now. And the show is about a black family, it's animated, but the guy who created it is white. Hmm. And so they need me. (laughs) Because this is not 20 years ago. Right. That's just not gonna work anymore. Mm -hmm. And and, well, it shouldn't. Um, But um, one of the things that I like about this project that we're doing is that, and actually, well, I'll get to this in a minute. But one of the things I like about it is that they do see the importance of being authentic with people of color. We are, we have promised that we're going to hire a writing team that is many different people, men, women of different ethnicities, because that's what one of the things the show is going to explore. And um, we're going to open it up to writers who need a chance to learn. I'm happy that the industry has changed. That was You kind of answered the last question. I'm happy that the industry has recognized that. And it's really focusing on the different stories, the different voices, because there's so much power in that. There's so much that you can take. There is. It's, it's, it's important to, to not only, you know, for voices to be authentic and inclusive. And if we can do that, you know, I was just on a meeting before I was talking to you. Um, Because I'm working with these people who are doing the kids of kid of the year, time kid of the year awards for going to be on Nickelodeon. And we were talking about different kids that we're going to be highlighting. And one of the producers says, well, we don't have any LGBTQ DI kids and we should have that. And I'm like, yeah. And it's like, you know, years ago, I wanted to write an episode of Tyena that had something to do with, you know, one of her friends was gay and, and she had to figure out how to, and Nickelodeon was like, no way, no way, couldn't do it. Wow. So things are progressing, hopefully. You know, a lot of it is progressing because of the tragedies that happened over the last year or so that woke the people up, excuse my French. Okay. But, um, you know, people have, have just got to wake up and, and hopefully this season of inclusion is not just the season. Yeah. But it's just the way things go from now on, you know. Anyway, stepping off the soapbox. <laughs> well, not yet, because the last question I just wanted to ask is because I, the reason I wanted to do these thing, these interviews um, with the creators of these shows is just what message would you give to Black creators right now who are feel like they can't do it? Like what would be, if you were on that soapbox, what would you tell someone who is a black creator that is struggling with putting themselves out there right now? Struggling because they don't believe in themselves? Or they just feel like they don't. There's a lot of people I talk to that just feel like they can't do it. There's something that you want. You have to first, if you don't believe in yourself, nobody's gonna believe in yourself. And this is coming from a guy who's had a lot of issues with confidence. Um, then had to talk myself off the ledge of, of, of not believing in myself many, many times, even to this day. But if you don't believe in yourself and don't believe you can do it, you won't be able to do it. You got to stick with it. And you have to say yes. Whenever opportunity comes your way. I mean, I got, they asked me to do this got job on Ghost Rider, and I'm like, okay, yes, I'll do it. I had never written a thing in my life. I had never used a computer in my life. I was sit on the train coming from Brooklyn into Manhattan, reading how to write for television. And as soon as we crossed over the bridge and got into, um, into Manhattan and 
the white people started getting on the train, I thought maybe somebody from my office would be on here. So I would put the book away because I didn't want them to know how green I was, that I'm reading a book, how to write for television. And I have a job working in television. But you, you know, say yes, jump off the cliff and grow your wings on the way down and you'll go up, you know? Right. An opportunity comes your way, you grab it. You talk yourself into believing yourself, just like you would talk to somebody else into making them believe in themselves. Sometimes, you know what? I used to have a friend that would say, you need to talk to yourself like you would talk to your kid. Imagine, I didn't have a kid at the time, but imagine what you would say to your kid if you wanted them to believe in yourself and say that to you and get off the bull. You know, if you want to do it, you can do it. Nobody's going to do it for you. I've had a hundred people, hundred thousand people. Yeah. You know, come to me and say, you know, I got this idea. Will you write it for me? No, I will help you learn to write it for yourself, but I got my own ideas. I can't spend my time writing your stuff. You have to do that. So that's what I would say. You know, don't give up. Fake it like you believe in yourself. Say yes to every opportunity that comes your way that you think can move you forward and learn in the moment. Learn in the moment. You can do that. I, I did it. I learned on the number two train going into Manhattan from Brooklyn. <laughs> and, and I had people, I was lucky enough to have people that were kind, you know then that's what you turn around and you do the same thing. You be a kind person, bring somebody else along to pay it back, you know? So, yeah. That was wonderful. Short question, long answer. No, that was, that was, that was perfect. That was great. Thank you. I could talk to you for, for hours. This has been, this has been fantastic. Thank you. That's, this has been a great conversation. Thank was, you for reaching out. Thank you for doing what you're doing, Todd. Yeah. Thank you so much. You enjoy Keep the rest of your day. Absolutely. You too. Have a good one. Bye. All right. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation with Fracaswell Hyman and drop any thoughts you have down in the comment section below. As I mentioned in the intro, my deep dive into the famous Jet Jackson is up next, scheduled to be released next week. So keep an eye out. Then expect videos for season three of Alex Mack, Taina, and So Weird following that. My next interview is going to be with, and <laughs> wait for it, Steven Spielberg. Just kidding. He has no idea who I am. The next interview is with I don't know yet because it's still in the process of being scheduled. But as soon as I know, you'll know. <laughs> in the meantime, feel free to stick around, you know, click some buttons and check out the rest of my videos here. Go ahead and follow me on social. Then don't forget to hit that thumbs up. It really helps me out. Then subscribe with the side of notification bell. Until next time, Shine on, you crazy diamonds.